you have your Bible, open it up to the book of Habakkuk. I didn't sneeze. That's actually how it sounds. Habakkuk. Go to the Old Testament. It's in the, at the end of the line of the uh, minor prophets there. I think it's about the fifth book from the end, somewhere in there. We have been in a study on uh, five things that I learned from looking at a tombstone. Um, one of the men, if I told you his name, you wouldn't recognize it, but he led one of the biggest, um, he was the president and CEO of probably the group that did the most for revival in all of the 20th century. And when he died, they, they put this on his tombstone. They said five simple things about the man. The first one was what we studied two weeks ago. We need to know God. We really need to know God. We know that there's a God there, but we need to come to know that God. And, and we need to understand that He is, and He can, and we need to be very comfortable in understanding not only is He, and He can, but He will. That's what we need to know about our God. And then last week, we talked about loving God. And our God is very loving. He is very kind. He is very generous to us. And we need to be true and faithful to Him in the same way that He is true and faithful to us. And uh, we are to love Him, not just simply because of what comes from His hand, but because He deserves it. He needs to be hallowed, honored. We need to give Him great reference, uh, reverence and, and respect. And today, we're going to look at the third thing, not only to know God, not only to love God, but we're going to talk about what it means to believe God, to believe God. I've been in church my whole life, and I know that in church there are certain things that we say that just flow very easily from our lips. We say, talk about words like faith, and we say, yeah, I have faith. You believe there's a God? Yes, I believe there's a God. There are just things that, that just flow so easily, but every now and again we need to check and we need to know, what does it mean to believe God? What does it mean to have faith? What does it mean to trust God? This is a very important thing. And um, Paul said in Ephesians that by grace are you saved through faith. Salvation comes by the, the gift of God for us, and it comes to us through faith. So I would say that faith is very important. We need to, we need to know that we've got biblical faith. We don't need to say, God, you've got to come and answer with the faith that, that, that I have. You've got, to, you've got to change yourself to me. No, no. We change ourselves to him. So we want to say that we, we want to learn these things so that we can have it personally and real in our own lives. Hopefully you found the book of Habakkuk by now. And if you have it, would you stand with us in reading God's word? We're going to begin reading in Habakkuk chapter number two. I'm aiming for verse number four, but I'm going to get a running start with verse number one. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak, it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Paul quotes this last phrase in the New Testament in the book of Romans and in the book of Galatians, the just shall live by his faith. Actually, let me read to you Romans chapter 1 verse 17. When Paul was speaking about the great salvation of God, he says this, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. God reveals his righteousness from faith to faith. 
as it is written, the just shall live by his faith. Let's pray. Now, Father, we ask once again, because you're the God who, who can, we pray, Lord, that you will, even again, speak to us plainly through your word. Draw us to yourself. Father, we do not need to hear just another message. I pray that we didn't just come to hear about you. I pray that we came to meet you afresh and anew. Lord, that as a friend would learn more about a friend, as one in love, we would fall even more in love. Lord, we have faith, but I pray that we will have true faith, real faith, growing faith, faith that will stand the test of circumstances. So Lord, we need you to come and speak to us. I do pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart will be pleasing unto you, and I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will amen those things that lift up Jesus Christ and bring him honor and glory. So, Father, speak as only you can. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Habakkuk was a prophet in the 7th century B.C. and a very important time in the people of Judah because they uh, had started to be invaded by the country of Babylon. It had started, and it had started, I guess you'd say, on the outward parts of it when they would go to one village at a time and start taking and, and the villages and taking the people there, taking their monies, taking their livestock, taking everything, and everything was pushing towards the great city of Jerusalem. And as Habakkuk starts to see this happen, he has issues with it, some things that he really uh, doesn't like that are happening. I love the book of Habakkuk. As a matter of fact, when it is written, it's really a matter of asking questions back and forth. Habakkuk will ask a question of God, and then God would come back with the answer to it. And Habakkuk was one of those people that would just, just bluntly say things. I always love people that you know, they may be a little awkward in how they say it, but they're just blunt. I, I like those kind of people. I get along with those kind of people very well. I mean, they just, they just say it. Y'all know, who the, know those people? Habakkuk was one of those. And, and if he felt it, he would just say it. And there were some things going on. And can, can I just say he was a little bit irritated that God wasn't doing things the way that he thought things should be done. How many of you know that the Bible says that his thoughts are not our thoughts? His ways are not our ways, right? Isaiah made it very plain and very clear that just because you think it doesn't know that it doesn't mean that it's best. And God only knows how to do that which is good and right and best, but yet in the in the process it might rub us a little bit the wrong way. Because here we are thinking we understand it, that we know better than the God of the universe. So look in chapter 1 in verse 2, and here is Habakkuk's complaint to God. O Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear. Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. He doesn't like what the Babylonian people are doing to the people of Judah. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore, this is, this is Habakkuk's conclusion. Therefore, the law is powerless. Justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Now, is he right? No, he's not right. And I love this. He even knows that he's not right. Look in chapter 2 again. He said, well, I will stand my watch and I will set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I'm corrected. He said, I know that I don't see this right. I know God's still God. And, and, and I'm looking at it and it doesn't make sense. Have you ever been in the, the midst of your circumstances or your troubles or the, the heartaches that you're bearing, all of these things, and you think you see it and you think you've got it, but yet 
you know that it can't be right and God can't be wrong. So there, there's some kind of dissonance in your life and you're saying, I just don't understand. And I want to understand. And that's how Habakkuk is. And then God comes to him and says, here's my answer. I've got an answer for you. And it's a contrast. And that's really what begins to happen here. When God, stay with me now, when God speaks and it kind of hits us in a different way, we need to hear it. And we need to, instead of trying to get God to change to us, we need to change to God, right? And we are all waiting to hear a word from him. So he says in verse 2, the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. I'm going to give you a word from me of truth, something that you can keep, something that will help, something that will bless, and I want you to remember it, right? So write it down on tablets. How many of you have had a great idea, but you never wrote it down? Ten minutes later, it was gone. Amen? I'll never forget that. That's so earth-changing. It just changes my life. I'll never forget. Now, what was it I said? Right? And God knows that we're like that. So he says, write the vision down. Write it down on tablets that he may run who reads it. Others are going to read this, and they're going to say, you know what? That'll preach. That, that, that's good stuff right there. I need that in my life. So he says, write it down. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. Habakkuk, the problem is, is that you're looking at it, but you're looking at what all the negative that's happening, but you don't see the end of the story, right? Sometimes we need to turn the page and read the next chapter. Have you ever been reading a mystery book and, and you're going through it and, and you don't understand it, but later on it becomes clear? That's really what's happening here. There's a vision that you don't fully see. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end, it will speak. It will not lie. It's good. You can trust it. Though it tarries, wait for it. Don't get impatient. God's never early, but he's also not late. He's an on-time God, right? Wait for it. Because it will surely come. You can trust him. As sure as the sun comes up in the morning, that sure we can have revival in our life. It will not tarry. I love what uh, Peter said, the Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some people count slowness, but is long-suffering for us, not willing that any should perish, but all to come to repentance. God is an on-time God. It might look like he's slow, but he's really not. You see, we need to hear a word directly from here. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. The word word there is rhema. It means a personal word for you. Faith comes by hearing. We need to hear from God. And hearing by that personal word for you. It's when the light comes on for you, so to speak. How many of y'all remember learning arithmetic? Two plus two is four. You heard about the boy that went to first grade, and, and he, he was uh, wanting to impress his parents, so he went to a, an older kid and says, teach me something they call arithmetic. And the child looked at him and said, two plus two is four. The little kid said, I got it. Two plus two is four. So that, that day he went home, and he was there with his parents. They said, how was, your, how was your day? And he said, two plus two is four. The parents were just aghast by it. First day in the first grade? He's learning math. How wonderful. You know, it really just proved to them what they already knew, that their child was a genius. Amen? Then the child looked at him and said, what's a two? Amen? Some of these things, we, we're, we're going through these things and we're, we're, we're trying to figure it out, but the light bulb doesn't come on yet, 
right? Some people, there it needs to be screwed in a little tighter. But you know what I'm talking about when the light bulb comes on? It, there's things that we say that we know, but we, we know them in our head, but we don't necessarily know them in our heart yet, right? And faith is one of those. But when God speaks and he makes it personal to you, and, and the light comes on. Now you're responsible for what you do with it. Today, I want us to hear from God. I want us to be challenged on faith because he says to us here in verse 4, there are two contrasting opinions. There are two ways that we can go through this and understand. In verse 4, he says, he says behold the proud. The proud. You know that group of people? They're kind of puffed up, kind of arrogant, kind of presumptuous, kind of self willed. And really, Habakkuk says, or God says to Habakkuk, they're unstable. Here's the word they're unsettled. They're relying on what they know what they believe, what they, they are trusting in. He says, behold the proud. You see the Babylonians out there? Those are some prideful people, and they think that this is good. They think that, hey, they're, this is a weaker people. I can come in and take all that they have, and it's mine. Hey, the, to the strong and to the mighty go the spoils. He says, his soul is not upright in him. Now, here is the hard part. We can look at the Babylonians and we can say, those are some evil people. But here he is saying there's a contrast between two choices. And he said there's one group of people that are relying upon themselves. They're trusting in themselves. They're, they're trusting in what they think and what they want. It's the right way and they're convinced in it. Their arrogance, they're so presumptuous and they think that they've got it. He says, but, that's one way, but he says, but, the just, the righteous, the ones that know truth, the ones that, that, that are hooked into that which is good and right, the just shall live, shall walk, shall act and through the difficult circumstances of life, shall react, right? If you take an orange and you squeeze it, what comes out? Whatever's on the inside. So you squeeze an orange, orange juice comes out. You take a Christian and you squeeze a Christian, what comes out? Should be Jesus. But if you take one that's proud and arrogant and self-willed and you squeeze it, you put it into circumstances, all this ugly stuff will come out too. And we pray nobody's watching us when it happens. I want to just pause here and let that sink in for a second. All of us live there. But he says the just, they're going to live their life by faith. That very Christian word that we quote so often. What does faith mean? Faith means when you're relying on something other than yourself. Now, y'all have heard the illustration. I could take that chair and I could bring it up here, and, and I, I have faith that that chair will hold me up when I sit down on it, right? I don't want to just say, well, I'm going to just sit in this chair and bam, hit the ground. I have faith that it will hold me up. When I get in the car out there and I'm going down the road, and I turn the steering wheel to the left, I have faith that it's going to go to the left. I don't want to turn the steering wheel left and it goes right. I don't want to hit the brake and it goes faster. Y'all hear me? I'm trusting that it's supposed to do what it's supposed to do. You have faith in it. How many of y'all been to the doctor? And the doctor says, here, go get this filled. And you go to the drugstore and, and they give you something and you don't know what it is. It just, your doctor said to take it, and you're looking at it, and you say, that pill's going to solve it? In my mouth I go, right? It can make you turn green. You don't know. 
But you, you're, you're, you're trusting, you're relying upon something else. Now that's faith. Come on now. Then there's faithfulness. And that means the one that you're trusting in, the one that you're relying on is reliable. The one that you're trusting in can be trusted. Now, your faith is in something else other than you. But faithfulness is something else that is okay, is good. I trust in God because he's trustworthy. I rely on him because I know he can handle it. He is, he can, and he will. Here's the difference. Some are the proud, the arrogant, the presumptuous, the self-willed. I mean, and they're convinced that they got it. And then there's the others that have the wisdom to step back from themselves and rely on someone else who is reliable to help them in that need. If, you're, if you've got a hope for heaven, if you've got a hope for heaven, you know you can't get yourself there. And you're looking to someone else who can get you there. So you have faith in one who can get you there. And you know that he is reliable. And my salvation is, is on the solid rock. It is sure because Jesus went to the cross of Calvary to pay for my sins. He shed his blood. He gave his life. They put him in the tomb, but he rose from the tomb. He is alive and well. He defeated death. So I don't have to worry about death. He is ascended, he ascended to glory. He is in heaven. So he can take me to heaven. He's the only one who can. So my faith in him is not that I'm good enough. I'm not. I need his grace. And it's not what I can do, but it's what he can do. And I'm trusting in the only one. Some people are going to get to heaven. They think they're going to get to heaven because they've done it good enough. Or they're going to trust in, the, uh, I, I was baptized. I can, I can take you up there, and I can dunk you all day. I might get you closer to heaven, but I'm not going to get you into heaven. You can, you can join this church, and you can join 10 other churches. That's not going to get you there. You can get dedicated. You can get confirmed. You can, get, you can do whatever, you can, whatever the world wants to call it. That's not going to get you there. What it takes to get you from where you are to where you want to be is a personal relationship with a God who can. God saves souls one heart at a time. And it's when we, like Paul said in Ephesians 2.8, for by grace are you saved through faith. But I want to ask you this. Is it real faith if you believe he can take you from here to heaven, but he can't, he can't take care of that little problem that you have in life? You can rely on him to get you to heaven, but you can't rely on him to deal with that personal issue that you're going through. Faith is like a muscle. It needs to be used to grow strong. It can atrophy when you don't use it. It is, it is a thing where you're trusting and relying upon God. Hold on now, listen to me. This is good. I got to tell you this. I don't want you to miss it. If you're having faith in the faithfulness of God where he can do it for you, then the blessings come to you. In other words, if he is true, and you know that God can take care of truth, and you're relying and you're following that truth, that truth will become part of you. If you know that he's loving, and you're relying on God to be loving, and as you seek to follow him, his love will become a part of you. If God is generous, and because you're relying on his generosity for you, as you seek to know him, as you seek to follow him, his generosity 
will become part of you. Because he is righteous, and because you are seeking to follow that which is righteous, then there will be righteousness in you. I love one of the translations of this word. The just shall live by faith. One of the translations says this, the just shall survive by faith. Have you ever been there where you just wanted to survive? Lord, I don't know if I'm going to make it or not. I'm down for the last count. I don't know about you, but every one of us need to have an issue in our life where we're trusting on God that if, if God doesn't come through, we're sunk. Now, you might not like that. We like to be self-controlled. I know, I, let me talk to the men for a second, but ladies, you listen too because I know you're just like us. How many of you like to rely on somebody else? I mean, something comes up and you, you just, well, I'll just trust in them. I don't have to do it. Guys, are you like that? Or how many of you like to rely on your, you don't want to have to rely on anybody else. Amen? That's, that's an oh me moment, isn't it? When I was a kid, we put together model cars. Anybody in here remember model cars, trucks? Some had airplanes and boats. I wasn't that smart. But I got model cars, and I the first thing I would do, you, you open this up, and it has all the parts in there. All you have to do is assemble them, paint them up, make them look good, right? And it's got instructions. It tells you exactly how to do it. Well, the first thing I did was throw away the instructions because I was going to do it the way I wanted to do it. And there were parts of it that looked real good. I mean, I paint them up just right, you know, and I'd, I'd have three different colors on the outside of it. It'd just sparkle, you know. And, but the engine, you had to put together the engine too. And there were some parts of it, but I guarantee you that thing would have never run in real life. Because you have so many parts and all of them have a place, but I always had leftovers. I had, a, had the box you could shake around with all the parts that were left over. There's a lot of us that we like to rely on ourselves. So you know what God does? God lets us rely on ourselves until we get to a place where we can't. Then we say, oh, God, what did I do? How many of us are truly living by faith? How many of us are truly walking by faith? I used this illustration in the first service. There's a man by the name of George Mueller. If y'all have ever heard of him, raise your hand. Some of y'all have. George Mueller was a great man of God. And, and he had orphanages for children. And he's, he's very well known for the orphanage that he had. And, and, and one morning he got up and um, they didn't have any food. So he gathered all the children together and he prayed and he thanked God for the food that they were about to receive, knowing that there wasn't any food in the house. Well, there was somebody who had made all this food for this other group of people, but they weren't there and they didn't need it, so they were trying to figure out what to do with it, and they brought the food to the house. As soon as they get through praying, somebody knocks on the door, and they've got all this food for the kids. Everybody loves to hear that story because they say, George Mueller had such great faith. Let me tell you, how, let me tell you the, the rest of the story. Had all this orphanages there didn't have a government to help him pay for it, didn't have anything else, and he never one time asked anybody else for anything other than God. If he had a need, you know what he did? He went and asked God about it. Isn't that a novel idea? He would go and pray to God and never mention it to anyone else, but people continued to bring him things. They, they took his life and they said, if you took all the money that were given to him and put it into modern day times, it would be over $150 million donated to him that he never one time asked anybody for except God. That's faith. Abraham, minding his own business, God said, Abraham, leave where you are. I've got, I, I want to take you to the promised land. I'm going to make you a mighty nation. 
You know what he had to do? He had to rely on someone else other than himself to provide provision, direction, substance, and, and he was leaving everything behind to go somewhere else. I mean, this was a big decision. He didn't have a cell phone where he could FaceTime and call home. I mean, he couldn't go to Israeli air and jump on the, the plane and get back home in 30 minutes in the aircraft. He didn't have that. When he left, he was fully relying upon God. That was step one. And he was supposed to have children like the sands of the sea. Only problem was he was old, didn't have any. His wife was barren. His wife came up with an answer. I got a handmaiden over here. Why don't you join up with her? If I can't have a child, have a child with her. Doesn't that sound like us taking matters into our own hands? <laughs> so they had a child, and God said, that's not the one. God says, I'm going to bless you with a child from Sarah. I love this fact. Abraham comes to him, literally laughs, and comes to God and says, Hey, can I talk? Can I talk you into Ishmael? Pretty good boy over here. Can't, won't he do? No. No. Sarah laughed about it too. But a hundred-year-old husband with a ninety-year-old wife had a child because they were relying on God to do something for them that only He could do. Church, listen to me. If God calls you in that path, God will sustain you in that path. If God calls you to walk by faith, God could sustain you in that faith. So then God goes to Abraham and says, uh, now your boy, Isaac, you know, your only son, Isaac, take him up out on Mount Moriah and offer him up there. Does that make sense? No. That's more than just religious talk right there. Take him. Take the torch, take the woods, build the altar, lay him on the altar, pull up the knife, and take his life. I don't think for a skinny second God wanted Isaac dead. He just wanted to know if to Abraham he trusted him. And God was more important to him than even his son, his only son, Isaac. We talk a lot about faith. Are we willing to walk it? Are we willing to do the thing that God would have us do? Are we willing to trust him? Oh, preacher, absolutely I do. Let's talk about money. Do you trust God with your money? I cannot tell you how many times in my 34 years preaching, people come to me and they'll say, am I supposed to tithe? Well, do you trust God? I actually had someone said, uh, do I tithe the gross or do I tithe the net? I said, what do you want to be blessed on, the gross or you want to be blessed on the net? How much? And they want to talk to me and, and try to come out in some way how they can, 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 can give to God and keep the money. I don't know. Can you trust him? But if, 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 if I do that, then I can't. You say you love him. Do you honor him first and among all things? I mean, it's, this is a simple thing. And church, by the way, y'all know I don't preach about money often, do I? We don't pass the plate anymore. We just have a green box in the back. You mail it to the church, whatever. I'm just amazed by the goodness of God. But I'm here to tell you that, that there are a lot of people, if you look at their life, they, if they can fit God in, okay, but if, 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 why is it that in churches the first thing to go when there's a financial crunch is missions? Well, we can't trust that. We've got to take care of this over here. I just wonder. You can afford the new truck, but you can't afford the tithe. I have seen people struggle with money their whole life, wanting to take shortcuts. There's no shortcuts to faith, folks. Either he's your provision or he's not. What about with people? Y'all have trouble with people you work with? Family? 
I mean the in-laws and the outlaws. Children, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, we might just have to trust God. What about those ugly people? Y'all know who I'm talking about. I mean the ones they can't get along with anybody. And they make, they make sure they know that, or you know that they don't get along with you either. But the Bible says we're supposed to love our enemies. The Bible says we're supposed to do unto others the way someone wants to do unto us. Come on. What about idols? Anybody in here got idols? I'm not talking about that little thing where you, you got a golden booba. If you got a golden Buddha in your house, there's another sermon you need to hear, right? But I just wonder what things that we've allowed in our life that have take more of our time, more of our attention, take more of our heart. Mom and Dad were talking about something one day, and Mom was talking about how she didn't have time to do this, time to do that. You know how a husband can hit the raw nerve? My dad said, well, you got time for all my children. <laughs> search for tomorrow. Y'all remember search for tomorrow? Yeah. What was the other one? I can't remember. What? Days of our lives. Oh. God help us all. It'll be all over town. The preacher was talking about search for tomorrow at New Holland Baptist Church. But isn't it funny how you never had time to do anything else, but you always had time for making sure that person who had had 72 heart attacks had been married to 32 other people if they were going to make it through that one more crisis in their life. My goodness. And we look at all these things that happen, and we just say, I don't know. I don't have any idols. I don't have any things that I hold closer to my heart than God. Truth of the matter is, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 that if we're not living a life where we're depending on God, trusting in God, and if God doesn't come through, we're sunk, then we're not living by faith, and we cannot please God except by faith. If you're looking for the nice, comfortable life with the nice bow on it that you just have settled in and you've got security, whether in the government, God help you, or the bank account, or that friend that you can call that will always come through, how come we can trust anything else but we don't trust God? How come we'll do everything else, but we don't pray to God? We just sang the song, choir sang the song about he's the God of our city. I don't know about you, I'm still praying for our city. That wasn't just something we did one point in time out there just, just for a moment. No, I, I'm praying that God brings revival to our city. I pray that God brings revival here. Matter of fact, Wednesday night in the spring, we, we did this, the circle maker. We had 35 people show up to come do the circle maker. I'm going to do it for the next five Wednesday nights. I wonder who wants to come and let their life be challenged. We're going to do the second part, draw the circle. I wonder, are we willing to put ourselves in the circle, draw a circle around ourselves and say, God, bless, revive, challenge, change everything inside the circle? I think we need to. For by grace... Are you saved through faith? Do you know Him? Do you love Him? Are you living a life of believing in Him? Not in theory, but in actuality.